some man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. My hallelujah.
your seats. Our reading today is going to be taken from the second Corinthians, the first chapter, 20th verse. Very prominent scripture, a scripture that I believe has come across in so many ways, either through reading wherever you have been, or friends sharing, or in statuses of your phones. It's a very prominent scripture. And today, by the grace of God, I want to build a certain relationship with you to that scripture. It's important for you to relate with that scripture. Hallelujah. I was sharing with the people in the first service and I told them that uh, when you go back to modern church history, there was a period called the charismatic movement period, where the church had awoken fully to the power of the Holy Spirit and the demonstration of the same. People were being filled with the Holy Spirit, and the works of that time were very spectacular, and some would fall under the power, would get slain under the power of the Holy Spirit. It was great, great spectacular things. And of course, miracles happened uh, strongly in that period. And then, as every movement would have it, there are always excesses, fanatic spirits that sometimes creep in. And some people lost the mind of what God was doing. And out of that came the indifference and assumption that if a man has not fallen under the power, therefore God has not what? Touched them. If a man is not shaking, therefore the Holy Spirit is not at work within them. Or perhaps maybe they saw that those that were greatly affected by the work of the Holy Spirit eventually got the miracle. And so some said, oh, why won't God touch me? Oh, yes. Sometimes the power of God will go through you and shake you, throw you. Yeah, we've all gone through that and do go through it. You know, sometimes the Spirit will overwhelm you, you know you know. But then there are those times you will receive even without shaking (laughs) an inch. It doesn't mean that you've received more than the other. No, let him that eateth not judge, he that eateth not 
see, that liberty is supposed to be there when it comes to the balancing of this wisdom. And then out of that also came a group that if they don't see the spectacular, therefore God has not what? Moved, or the man of God is not anointed. And then out of that womb, God gave us another move uh, called the word of faith, which began about the late 50s, especially in the United States, the proponents of that move, like Kenneth E. Hagin, if you've read their books, you'd understand. What were they trying to build? The word of faith movement came with the mind that if I don't get filled, if I don't, I mean, if I don't check or if I'm not affected a certain way, it does not mean that the word of God is ineffective in my life. I can still receive my healing, my breakthrough, my answer, my solution. Uh, if I build a life that connects to the word uniquely. And they started teaching it. And it started working. It started working. It was effectual. People started to see the results of that work. And so the divide was there, but the divide was not necessarily there to disqualify what was there because every new birth is as a result of an old womb. But God was seeking the reconciliation of the word and the spirit. Are you following? Those of you who have been in Uganda for some time, I might not uh, explain it keenly to those of you who were born in the 90s, but those of us who were born in the 80s, mid 80s, early 80s, late 80s, we saw movements that came. By the time we come into the mid 90s, into early 2000, Uganda as a nation was split in two groups. You had the group of, of, of people who knew nothing except to demonstrate the power. They cast out devils, they rebuke spirits, people roll, they cast out things. And, you know, you see all manner of demonstration. You see all manner of uh, spectacular uh, manifestations. And again, the fanatics are there, but notwithstanding that the work of God was evident. People were healed of HIV, the lame walked, the blind saw, the crippled walked. It was an amazing movement. And then there was another movement again of another leader, or a couple of few leaders, who, for them, they focused entirely on teaching the word. There was nothing spectacular in the meeting. There was nothing, you know, demonstrative in the meeting. And some actually did not believe in, you know, the being slain in the spirit or whatever. And so you had this very consistent group of people that were teaching so efficiently. And they were speaking English. And they were articulate. And they got the elite, the educated people. They easily connected with these people. You understand? Because they were speaking things that were understandable. They were a more orderly bunch than the other uh, charismatic. And as always as it is, the, 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 the more orderly bunch usually had more people dying of cancers. And if you are in that church, you'll never walk if you're crippled. That, that one, forget. If you're in that kind of order, you, you don't need to. There are certain things you wouldn't see. Or at least I attended some of those. One I attended for some time. But I never saw that open an, an, an eye open, a blind eye open. I never saw a deaf ear open. Oh, yesterday we were in prisons. I preached in Monkson's Bay. Hundreds of your relatives there got born again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and deaf ears opened. Miracles happened. It was amazing. Hallelujah. So anyway, back to the story. So you had the English elite, educated, polished group they don't care the demonstration, they just want that word. And then you had the crude but rough-edged charismatic group that has no respect of doctrine. And some of which also did not care about character or you know, moral standing. All they want is God is here and is going to move power. You understand? So the divide grew strong as we went into the 2000s, if some of you remember those days. You either belonged to this one or the other one. And a couple of years later, in the work of God showing me what he was doing in our nation, the Lord told me these two were not supposed to be divided groups. They were supposed to be a place of reconciliation because the word and the spirit must agree. If you are a teacher of the word, you must agree that there is a place of demonstration of power. And if you're a demonstrator of power, you must understand you don't grow church by just praying for the sick and casting out devils and prophesying. You need to ground your people in truth. You need to raise families. You need to raise responsible citizens and plant and position them beyond the anointing wisdom. Because that's the reconciliation. Christ 
the wisdom and the power of God. You see that? He is the wisdom and the power of God. So we don't just talk about Christ from a perspective of wisdom. He was not just a wise man, but he was also the power of God. So we're believing for a generation where the word and the power are reconciled. That is the next move. That is the next move. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. But back to the issue of the word of faith. And then in the word of faith, for those of you who say they were taught things like confession, positive confession, thinking right and stuff like that. And these things were embedded in the daily teaching, which started to work wonders as well as super soul miracles. But then they had a problem that there were individuals who were confessing and doing all these positive thoughts, but they did not see the results of their confession. And somebody confesses and confesses, I won't die, I won't die, I won't die, until they wither and die. And that also brought more questions in the church. But sister so-and-so believed. Brother so-and-so was a mighty man of faith. How could he die? And then they sort of cover it. They decorate it with, you know, such are the ways of God. You see? But the issue was, and I said it once, or twice, that they did not have a relationship with the words that were spoken. And that relationship begins from the revelation of that word, not just the confession because you trust the speaker, but the transition of revelation to catch your spirit enough to come to carry the true vision of what is said. You find a Christian who says, greater is he which is in me than he which is in the world. And they're screaming. It's on their statuses. They've designed things out of that, arts out of that. And then that very Christian who has made that sentence tomorrow calls you and says, Apostle, I fear entering my house. Somebody put something under the bed. Are you following? If greater is he which is in you than he which is in the world, how come you are afraid of the things they put under your bed? But you were saying, the scripture is mine. It has been my scripture. So if it is your scripture, then why isn't it working in your life? You do not have a relationship with that word. And that is a challenge we have with many Christians who claim portions of scriptures, write them on their cars, write them on their shirts. They have everything written outside, but they carry no bearing of testimony within concerning the very words that they are speaking. So it is with this portion of scripture today. Ah, we know 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea and amen and to the glory of God. We all know it. But do you have a relationship with that portion of scripture? Do you really understand what it means? And that's what I want to take a few minutes to help you understand. It says that God will build something in you to give you answers in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout <laughs> hallelujah. Now, let's read the amplified version of it. The Amplified Version says, for as many as are the promises of God, and I want to hear that, they all find their yes answer in him, Christ. For this reason, we also utter amen, so be it to God through him in his person and by his agency to the glory of God. He's saying for as many as the promises of God, all of them find their yes. God has given you promises, so he will say yes to you. So you will never find a no in what you know is the perfect will of God. What you know is the perfect will of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. So the answers, the answers to the questions of our lives are aimed in the revelation of understanding how the promises of God operate and how we are supposed to apply them, not just know them, but to apply them in our individual lives, our households, our communities, our businesses, our careers, uh, whatever, wherever God has placed us in life. Somebody shout amen. They find their answer. They don't minister questions. The Bible speaks of and meets and endless genealogies which minister questions to the hearts of the hearers rather than godly edification which is through faith. Every person who walks the life of faith should not minister questions. They should be givers of answers. What do I mean by that? People say, ah, but you're telling us you're born again for these years. How come we don't see it working in your family? 
He's saying by his stripes you were healed. How come we see you sickly? You're saying that the Lord shall provide for your needs every day. We know you're saying you're rich, but we don't, we, you're the landlord wants his money. You don't have it. You fail to take your children to school. You don't have anything, any income. What, 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 why? Why are you like that? You see, that's a ministry of questions. Faith is not a minister of questions. Faith is supposed to be a minister of answers. Somebody shout hallelujah. <clears throat> but then we need to now go intricately to study this topic and understand how do we appropriate the promises of God? What are they to us? When Peter is speaking in uh, Second Peter, if you begin from chapter 1 or about verses 2, he tells the church or speaks over the church that grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. According, the Bible says, as his divine power has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him which has called us unto glory and virtue. And verses 4, he says, whereby we're given great and ex exceeding great promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, follow this conversation. Grace and peace is multiplied to you, hallelujah, through, the Bible says, the knowledge of him that has called you. Hallelujah. And then in the next verse he says, his divine power has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything you'll ever need to life and godliness. Through that same knowledge. And that same knowledge has called you to glory and virtue, not shame and frustration. But how that power is manifested in your life to give you all that pertains to life and godliness, it has connected you to the exceeding and great promises because by these you become a partaker of the divine nature. And it's important, firstly, that the nature is defined before you walk in this power. But for that nature to be defined, you have to have the revelation of his word, promises. If you read the Amplified Version, it says we are given absolutely, he says by his means we, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceeding great promises so that through them you may escape by flight from the moral decay. You will be disconnected from the corruption that is in the world. You will be disconnected and escape from the moral decay that is in the world because of the covetousness, uh, covetousness, the lust and greed, that you might become a sharer in the divine nature. The message version says that you, uh, you're given terrific promises to pass on to you as tickets to participate in the God life or the life of God. These are tickets to participate in the life of God. It says that when people see you, they see you as one with the life of God. Promises are the only tickets that will allow you to function in the life of God. And I tell people that the ministry, you know, of the spirit in Christ is an altar. Truth is an altar. You see, when the Bible says we have an altar from which they have no right to eat, it is the revelation of the truth of which we stand that gives us right function and application in the spirit realm. And this altar has horns. One of which is the finished work of Christ at the cross. And what that blood has done for us, it gives us access, okay? But also, one of the fundamental horns on that altar is the promises of God. This is the one thing you can hold on to in your plea with God. This is the one thing you can stick to and expect an answer when you are speaking to God concerning an issue. So you don't take the promises of God lightly. 
It's a very powerful weapon. It's a very powerful weapon. But then you have Christians who are 10, 5 years, 3 years. And then you tell them, get a pen and a paper and write only 10 promises that you know in Scripture. Only 10. Only 10. And I tell you, you might spend a whole day and they don't have three or four. But they're born again. They're tongue speaking. They, they, you know, they, they, are, they, they are regular church members, but they have not yet appreciated and understood the power. And no wonder that such person listening to me is failing somewhere in their lives. They're not living their lives fully because they have not understood the horn of promises. The horn of promises. Somebody shout, hallelujah. Now, so from where did Paul get this? How did Paul receive this? How did he connect to this reality and truth? How did Peter build what I've just shared? How did Peter see that this connect us, connects us to the divine nature? It helps us participate in the God life. It helps us live like sons of God, not just mere human beings. How did Paul know that the promises of him are yeah in him and amen to the glory of the Father? Why? Because they studied the ways of God. They studied the ways of God. The Bible says, my son, give me your heart. And let your eyes observe my ways. They studied the ways of God and saw through the lens of biblical history. And they said, this is how God works. He does not fail on his promise. But the question is, how do we appropriate the promises of God in our lives? I'll give you two examples in scripture. And we're going to go back to the Old Testament. First story is Jacob. We know very well Jacob stole his, his brother's birthright. Flees to Laban, marries a wife there too actually, serves for the animals. After that long time, the Lord appears to him and tells him, go back to your country, go back to your people. I'll build you there. And so a time comes in Genesis 32 where Jacob has to go back to his people. From the verse up, you'll see the mangers meet, meet him and... Um, the, the, they minister to him and then Jacob sends messengers uh, before him to Esau, his brother, and to the land of Seir and he commands them, speak to my Lord, your servant is coming and I stayed with Laban, but the Lord has told me to return back home. And in, when they go to Esau and tell him what Jacob has said, Esau gets on his way to come and meet his brother. But he does not give any message to the messengers. He tells them, I'm coming. That's all. So they do not know what to expect. Is this guy coming to kill? Is this guy coming to make peace? Is this guy coming to cause havoc? What is he coming to do? Of course, Jacob knows that the last conversation they had was not good. So he expects he's in trouble of some sort, but he doesn't know how to fully explain it. Verse 6, the messengers return to Jacob saying, we, have, we came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee and 400 men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands and said, if Esau comes to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, oh God of my father, listen, Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which spake unto me, Return to, and, and, and to me, return unto thy country and unto thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. He says, I am not worthy of the list of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have showed unto thy servants. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Now he's saying, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of his soul. He's scared. He's scared. So he's saying, deliver me. Oh God of my fathers, I came with nothing and you gave me quite a lot. You're the one who told me, go back to your country and your kindred. I will deal with you well. But here now, I've sent a message to my brother. I don't know what I'm expecting. I'm in trouble. I'm frustrated. I'm scared to death. I don't know what this man is going to do. So he's asking, I pray thee, oh God. He says, from the hand of my brother, deliver me from the hand of my brother. So, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. 
Next verse. And you said, now this is a man provoking a promise, that I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitudes. You said it. What did Jacob do? He brought God to remembrance of a promise. In prayer, you say it, that you will surely do me good and make my seed as the sand of the sea, and which cannot be numbered. They cannot be counted for multitude. You promised me. You promised me. This is a man bringing remembrance to God. And the scriptures tell us if you follow down, he lodged there that same night uh, and then took of that which came to, to his hand a present to Esau. He sent gifts to Esau and sent gifts to Esau, separated them and then told his people to go ahead of him. And then down in the verses below, he was left alone. And when he was left alone, the Bible says a man came and wrestled with him until the breaking of the dawn. Jacob tells the man, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he fought. And at the end of the day, this man says, from today, you are Israel because you have power with men. You have fought with God and you have overcome. From today, your name shall be called Israel. For as a prince has power with God and with man, and you have prevailed. He has given him a name called Israel. Now, it's important for you to note, because I'm going to come back there. Put something there. Just yeah, clip it. I'm going to come back to that portion of scripture. For God to be reminded of his promise, of what he said, and immediately he changes the name of Jacob to Israel. And we know that by the time Israel meets who? Jacob, uh, sorry, Esau, God has created an atmosphere of reconciliation and that's how that household what? Reconciled. But how did God answer this man's prayer? He brought to remembrance what God said. Do we bring to remembrance as a God who has forgotten? No. God does not forget, he never forgets. But it's in the revelation of prevenient grace for God to prompt your spirit to remind him of his promises, not as one who has forgotten, but because it is his redemptive power to change the course of your destiny. Who has understood what I just said? So we don't remind God because we have forgotten. He has forgotten. God cannot forget. But we remind God because by grace, he prompts us to provoke him with the very reminder because he knows he cannot go against his promise. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. That is what Paul saw. That is what Peter knew. And that is why they said, for the promises in him are yea and the men to the glory of the Father. When you remind God of his promise, you provoke something to come and intervene on your behalf. Somebody shout hallelujah. May you remind God tonight in Jesus' name. Similar issue happens in the time of Moses. In Exodus, the 32nd chapter, the ninth verse. And I want us to read from the Amplified Version to give us a foundation of what happens. The children of Israel have been under bondage for hundreds of years. Moses goes by the leading of God and delivers them. They have seen plagues maraud the children of Egypt. They have seen the wondrous works of God as he parted the sea for them to go through. And they are going through the wilderness to the promised land. But with all the works that they have seen by God, they still rebel against God. And God is tired of their wickedness. He's tired of their demonic worship. He's tired of their indifference. They are horrible. And he says, you know what? I want to destroy these people. So, at verse 9, we find the Lord having a conversation with Moses at the destruction of this people. So the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. They are hard-hearted. 
They cannot see another side of me. They only see one dimension. They're stiff-necked. And the next verse says, Now, therefore, let me alone. This is God telling Moses, Leave me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may destroy them, but I will make you a great nation. He's telling Moses, I know you're a pastor. You don't want to lose people, and I understand that. But allow me to destroy these people. And after I have destroyed them, I promise you, Moses, I'll build you another nation. Don't worry about these ones. I am tired of them. I abhor everything that they do. And the next verse, now this is Moses speaking back. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath blaze hot against your people whom you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why are you doing this? You've delivered them. Why are you doing this to them? You're the one who got them out of Egypt. You should have left them to die. But you have delivered them. Why should your wrath come on people you have delivered? And the next verse says, Why should the Egyptians say, For evil he brought them forth to slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Then he tells him, Turn from your fierce wrath and change your mind concerning this evil against your people. Otherwise they will say you brought Egypt later will change the narrative from God delivered the children of Israel to you brought them out of Egypt that you might destroy them in the wilderness. Don't do it. Oh, you mean God didn't know that? You mean whatever Moses is speaking, eh? Is something that is catching God unawares? You mean Moses is awakening God's memory? No, he's not. This is God talking to Moses and the same God talking through Moses. For the reader to learn his heart. But you see, if you are from a pragmatic language, you might not interpret this because you will not see from which dimension God is speaking. And this is why Paul helps us when he says, for these things are written a for for your learning. God allows certain things for your learning that you through patience and comfort of scriptures you might have hope. This was for your learning. God allowed this that you and I in 2022 would look back and be able to learn the heart of God. It didn't mean that God was annoyed and then Moses was the wiser one. Come on, he created this man. God is wisdom. He is power. He's everything. He's all-knowing. You see? So it's not that God did not know what Moses was saying, but God speaks to Moses and speaks through Moses that you, the learner, can see a third dimensional reality of this interpretation. God didn't want to destroy them, but he knew that there is no way I cannot not destroy them except through Moses I appropriate the law of the horn of promises. Of, of the promise. That is why in the next verse, the Bible says, this is now Moses still praying. He says, earnestly remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and say to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and all this land that I have spoken of you will I give your seed and they shall inherit it forever. He has reminded God of the promise he made to the patriarchs. You see, he has appropriated the horn of promise. Remember what you told these men. Now, before I even go there, let me show you the mystery here. Do you realize that when they're talking about the patriarchs here, they talk about Isaac, Abraham. They don't call him Jacob. They call him Israel. Do you realize that in scripture here, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, not Jacob? Do you know why they don't use the word Jacob? Because Jacob was not an inheritor of promise. Israel was the inheritor of the promise. You see? Now, let's go back to the story where I had told you to leave a clip there. You remember when, when, when uh, Jacob is speaking to God, he said, you said, surely I will do thee good. You told me that I will do you good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea. Multiplication, which cannot be numbered by multitude. But does multiplication belong to Jacob or Israel? Answer me. You see, so what has God got to do? He's got to change the name from Jacob 
to Israel. So he will appropriate the promise of multiplication. You see, that is what Moses sees in Exodus and says, remember the promise you made to Abraham, the promise you made to Isaac, and the promise you made to Israel. He does not say, Jacob. You see what I'm saying? The promise preceded the naming. But in God's infinite wisdom, to appropriate and manifest the promise, he has to name right. So some of you must understand the power of salvation. Because salvation names you. Slap somebody and say they are talking about me. Salvation names you. Yes. What a deep thought. What a deep thought. So let's go back. You promised these people that you'll multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And this land that I've spoken to you, you said you'll give to their seed that they might inherit it. Now, if you kill them, so he tells them, then Lord turned from the evil, which, no, verses 14, then the Lord turned from the evil, which he thought to do his people. God changed his mind because a man reminded God of his promise. Are you learning something? A man reminded. He didn't plead, oh God, please don't kill them. Do it for me. No. He held God by the horn of promise and said, you told our patriarchs that you multiply them. Killing 360,000 people is not multiplication. It is taken away. I know you can make a great nation and still fulfill your promise, but it will also mean that you have frustrated this first one because of what the Egyptians will say and what the fathers in heaven will look at you for. And God said, oh, the promise. He changed his mind. And if you read scripture, you will realize this, that Moses was wrong. <laughs> if you read scripture, you will realize that Moses was wrong. God knew what he was doing. Why? Because number one, eventually, many of those people Moses was fighting to preserve by their own wickedness were destroyed eventually in the wilderness. Do you agree? So he just wasted time. Do you understand what I'm saying? But number two, the very children of Israel in there were mixed multitudes that stirred rebellion within the camp. And eventually, these are the people that stir Moses to anger and he smites the stone he was supposed to speak to. And then he did not make it to the promise. He never fulfilled his destiny because of the very people. That means if Moses knew what was going to come, he would have trusted God to take these people away and build the same nation. But even when God knows he's right, the promise still provokes him to respond to the prayer of a man. If you do not understand this, you have not understood anything. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is, so is the power of the promise. Even when a man is wrong, God can look at that promise and still answer. Wow. 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 That is why in Isaiah, the 62nd chapter, the sixth verse, if you read from the Amplified Version, he says, I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace day or night. You who are his servants, and by your prayers, put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. Keep not silent and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her a praise in the earth. He's talking about you, 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 who put the Lord in remembrance of his promises in your prayers. Somebody shout hallelujah. You. Who put the Lord in remembrance of his promises in your prayers? He's saying you're the right people to pray. And he says when, when, when you pray that way, keep not silent. Do not stop praying that way until Jerusalem is established and her praise is in the earth. He's saying that is the one thing you need to keep to do as a watcher. And for anybody appointed to watch over you or pray for you, that's his responsibility. Now, as a spiritual authority, God has appointed me to watch over you as your spiritual father. When I am praying, I have to appropriate the promises of God 
every day in remembrance to him concerning your lives you say that my children shall never fail none shall be snatched from under me they are for signs they are for wonders as a spiritual authority i pray it but as an individual concerning my own personal issue this is the way i make my plea to god i put remembrance to him concerning what he has said in his word and when i do that then i turn to the devil and address the devil for whatever it is after i have put god in remembrance that's the right way to pray there's something about going to the face of the father and telling him you said that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that turns its, its voice against me it shall be held in condemnation you said that i'm going forward you said that i'm blessed you said that health is mine you said that you shall preserve my household you said and therefore i stand in that authority to address every spirit that is frustrating my destiny frustrating my dreams frustrating my innovations frustrating my plans frustrating my businesses get out because God said he said he said he said just take him at his word you said it and hold there yeah 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 the doctors are, but you said but with long life you will satisfy me and reveal your salvation to me i don't care whether they say that i have two weeks or four weeks or but you say it somebody shout hallelujah shout glory to god and all those who god appoints to pray for you ought to pray that way but many christians they go to god Please help me, Lord. Help me. I'm stuck, Lord. Help me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let him return, Lord. Let Peter forgive me. I, I, I know I did wrong, but he can forgive me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I pray, give me my job back. They fired me, but me, I didn't steal the money. In Jesus' name. Amen. No! You said, you said that you will never suffer the righteous to see corruption, nor his soul rot in hell. I will not lose my job. I will not lose my job. In the name of Jesus, they are calling me back. That's the right prayer. My marriage cannot fail in the mighty name of Jesus because you said, who saw the Lord joins together? Let no man put asunder. This man is a man too. Ay, 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 ay. Then you speak words. That's praying right. But some of you, if he goes, he goes. If he comes, he comes. Let your will be done. <laughs> Somebody shout glory. Shataco para de go Marego tila barate Masopra taco shatala Recayoba. I cannot fail. Oh, rede go zikala. Why? Because it says, Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. You say, You'll always cause me. You'll always cause me to triumph. And you make manifest the server of your knowledge by me in every place. You say that I'm not a conqueror. You say that I am more than a conqueror. You say that. And I believe it to be true. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. And when you exercise yourself in such glories. And then start to see the imminent marks of manifestation. You learn to claim bigger promises. Hey, you stop for you stop claiming the promises of landlords paid. You stop claiming the promises of paying off your, your, your loan in the bank. No, you go deeper. What about ASCII of nations? And I shall give them to you. Slap somebody and tell them you're bigger than that. Makato Rabadegosa. He said, you just go to God and say, you told me to ask you of nations and you shall give them to me for an inheritance. The, the message version is even a bit more arrogant. It's extravagant. It says, what do you want? 
So you start from there and say, you ask me what I want. Continents, nations as a present, you say is you just command them to all dance for you or throw them out on tomorrow's trash. You ask me what I want and you get me the choice to even ask for nations and command continents to come and bow as a price to the glory of God. And I stand on that word to say, Uganda is mine, Africa is mine, Europe is mine, United States is mine, Asia is mine, the Pacifics, the islands, the byways, they are mine to the glory of God. Now imagine a man praying that way and somebody is still asking for breakthrough to get promotion at their workplace. I rebuke you in Jesus name. Tell somebody ask for bigger. I tell people listen. Even when you're praying in church, ask for something that will scare the person standing next to you. When you say Mercedes, Mercedes, da, even unbelievers ask for Mercedes. But imagine you're in a prayer meeting and you're seated next to somebody. And you're saying, Father, Thailand, Thailand in Jesus' name. The president is mine. The prime minister is mine. <laughs> Glory! It is not of God if it can't scare somebody. Uh -uh. That's not a vision of God if it's understandable. You need a vision that will slap mathematics and physics out of somebody. The Bible says in Habakkuk, listen, Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 2. The Bible says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Oh, 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 oh. You write something and somebody reads it and says, either run to fulfill it or away from it. You either revive or offend no middle ground that's political correctness somebody shout hallelujah we are tired of generations that are still asking for ground nuts generations that are still asking for Jewish in the presence of God you're asking God for <laughs> mobile phones and I rebuke you stop asking for shoes stop asking for bags the world is perishing ask for Asia ask for the Middle East ask for United Arab Emirates and yes you can change it because with God all things are some of you are visiting for the first time and you're saying eh, these guys are too loud Give me a few weeks with you, you'll shout too. Just give me a few weeks, you'll also shout. Somebody shout hallelujah. No, it's not excitement, it's response. The inner minute, the inner man is stirred. Hallelujah, glory to God. You ask for things that scare, you claim promises that are too crazy now if you if, if, if God tells a man I have given you Jericho its kings its princes it's he has given him a land and the kings thereof so that means at one point in Jericho even the king belonged to Joshua the king was a subject to claim promises that give you presidents Aha! Oh! Somebody's starting to run now. What, what is this guy saying? What, this guy is landing, he's landing us in trouble. No, 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 no. I'm London. I'm just trying to awaken you. The Bible says that I shall go upward and forward. He says, I have set you above only underline the word there only i will make you the head and not the word that's a promise if you go in an institution please don't be humble 
No. Bust in faith and say, I am here, but I'm going to the top. In the name of Jesus. Because I am the head and not the tail. And God said, I shall be above and above only. I remember when I entered the banking my first year. First day I entered the bank. And I said, Father, you said we can only be above. And above only. First year. 12 months I was already a supervisor. Two, three years down the road I was already a branch manager. And at one time I think I was among the youngest branch managers in the country. And somebody asked me, how do you grow so fast? How do you advance so fast? You're still young and you're already a branch manager. But something in there is boiling. It's going up. It's going up. It's going up. Above only. And it says, and thou shall not be beneath. That means you will never fail. That means you'll never found or you'll never be found on performance improvement plans of your organization. In the mighty name of Jesus, you claim it for yourself. People might say you're arrogant. No, where is our boasting? Seven faith above only. For Nero can't go down. It can't. Those who say don't know me. Those who say it don't know me. They don't know how it started. Know where I came from. And it's okay. So is everyone born of the spirit. We're like a wind. You know it's not where it cometh from. <laughs> know where it goeth. <laughs> but, but, but you feel it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say I am the head. I'm above. I'm above. Only. No compromise. That means those that go beneath, they don't look like you. Those that sink under pressure, they don't look like you. Those that falter and fail, they don't look like you. Those that regress, don't look like you. Those that don't make it, don't look like you. Those that die early, don't look like you. Those that are defeated, don't look like you. Those in debt, don't look like you. Those with failed marriages, don't look like you. Those with miscarriages, don't look like you. Barren people, don't look like you. You know who you look like. Somebody shout hallelujah. And God says, as crazy as it is, in him it is yes. And amen. Touch somebody and tell him, don't be intimidated by success. That is who you are. Yes. Somebody shout hallelujah. Don't be intimidated by progress. That is who you are. Hey, Kotila Baradego Shatapa. You know, I've been preaching this gospel for many years. And I cannot help to tell you just how many people who have been raised under this teaching, the messages they sent me. Oh, apostle, I was made CEO. Oh, apostle, I've been promoted three times this year. What? Three times this year. Are you hearing me? Why? The promise, the promise, the promise, the promise, the promise. I cannot tell you how many people have gotten married. 35 year olds, 45, 50, 60 year olds, 70. If they want marriage, they get it. Why? The promise. I cannot tell you the men who have come out of this ministry and they're shaking the world already. The promise. Many of you, when you joined this ministry, you had nothing. Some of you joined with sandals, you joined with old bags, and then you began to receive. You began to connect to the promise. And sometimes I'm walking and I see you packing, and I'm like, that's my daughter. I knew her. You might not know her, but the day she joined, she had an old wig, but she believed God. Tell your neighbor the promises are true. Yeah. Above only. 
Fanero, we are above only. We are leading the next move of the spirit in the world. Yes. How many people my age are doing what I'm doing in Africa? How many people my age are doing what I'm doing in Europe? How many people my age are doing what I'm doing in America or, or South America? That tells you something. That tells you something. Every morning I get a hold of that promise and say, Father, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm levels and light years ahead of my peers. I believe it in the spirit. You also claim it and use it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Get to your feet and say something that will make your neighbor question why they sat next to you. thought that fills his heart every morning, noon, and night. He loved me when I didn't care, was patient till I kept running back into his arms. Look how he turned my life around. Made me a shining star, his glory to reveal. I will worship him forever, him forever because his God is to the I will worship him forever. Don't look too far to see how good he is. Just look at me. Claim it for yourself. He took me from the merry clay, set my feet upon the road, and standing in his righteous name. Let's check it again. 
is God is too good oh I will worship him forever forever because against everything that compromised what you believe to be the promise of God upon your life I condemn every spirit that says you will never make it I condemn every spirit that says you'll never progress because he promised that the path of the just shines brighter and brighter unto a perfect day it says that the longer you will live the brighter you will shine I judge the spirits that say that you will never flourish again. That what you lost in the past will never return. Because the Bible says that he will restore the years that were eaten by the canker worm, by the caterpillar, and by the walk locust and the palmer worm. I condemn the spirit that sought to kill you early because he promised with long life I will satisfy you and I will reveal my salvation to you. I condemn the spirit that wanted to keep you in poverty. Your spirit of poverty, I rebuke you. For the Bible says that it is God who gives us power to make wealth that he might establish the covenant that he made of our forefathers. For we know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sex he became poor that through his poverty you might be rich I rebuke poverty out of your life and your household I rebuke the spirit that wanted to keep you blind that wanted you to keep you indifferent from the things of the spirit because he promised that I shall be your father and you shall be my child I will teach you I will lead you in all my ways I will cause you obey my statutes he promised you that he will never let you see corruption nor your soul rotting in hell I condemn the spirit that spoke barrenness over your body over your business over your career over your dream the Bible says none among them shall be barren not even their cattle in the mighty name of Jesus Christ you go forward the glory of the latter church shall be greater than the glory of the former I condemn the spirit that has kept you in your past and has made you live in the past tense look into your future our eyes are on Jesus the author and finisher of our faith oh hallelujah give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise he promised you that I shall forgive you of all your iniquities and heal you of all your diseases I claim divine health over you cancer diabetes high blood pressure bone issues blood issues head issues throat issues I judge them reproductive issues I judge you in Jesus name clap your hands to God like it is done Jesus just thank him take a few seconds and thank him thank you Lord now if you're here and you have never given your life to Christ nothing spoken tonight will make sense and appropriate until your name changes you need a new name and that comes 
through the name of Jesus. The Bible says there's no name given under the sun where with men must be saved by the name of Jesus. So I want to give you the opportunity if you're there and you say, you know, today I've had in my heart for so long, today I'm going to receive him as my Lord and Savior. There's no perfect day. There's no perfect moment. It is today. Come now and receive him as your Lord and Savior. speaking on somebody and it's saying she'll not prosper I hear it I've had you and for this cause I charge you in the name of Jesus get out of her life I silence you he will go forward she will go forward Somebody clap your hands to Jesus. God is delivering somebody. God is delivering somebody. Power of the Holy Ghost. Lose her. There's another person there on that window, neck on that line. God is delivering you right now in the name of Jesus. Power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. A young lady called Jessica. Touch your stomach. Heal in Jesus' name. There's a young man called Ronald. You're hearing me now. You've been sick for long and you don't know why you've been sick. God is revealing and redeeming tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Wow. Every Sunday we have street children here who come to salvation. So when you see some dressed differently, we feed them every Sunday and uh, for some we're planning the education and many other things but uh, we have a guy who makes sure that we bring them here to receive jesus somebody shout hallelujah repeat this words after me those of you who are here father say father god i thank you say for jesus i thank you because jesus died for my sins and was raised for my glory today I receive you Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior I'm born again amen put up your hands and I pray for you father bless them establish them work in their lives more than ever before in Jesus name amen some of you told me you want to work with me to help these street kids. But we're going to have to first accept them that they are part of us. You know, some of you say, oh, I don't want to sit next to a dirty person. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's why God sent us to change the lives of these young men because you don't know who we are raising here. So those of you whose names you've written, please follow that person. We're going to take your names and numbers, follow you up, help you know what it means to be born again. In Jesus name and those of you who are going to school you will excel in Jesus name broadcast was brought to you.
to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at fenero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Fenero, make man.